Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 5G, where we're going to take the complicated relationship between genotype and phenotype that we developed in the last couple of lectures, and we're going to see if we can understand why it's so complicated. Fundamentally, the problem is in our expectations, that we think things should be simple because we think of phenotypes as simple things, but of course they're not. We'll think about this specifically in the context first of metabolic genes, genes that code for proteins that catalyze um, enzymatic reactions, and then we'll think about it in the context of genes encoding regulatory proteins. So here's again the problem. Why do most genes affect more than one phenotype? Why can't we have this nice, simple situation that we see in introductory genetics textbooks? And the answer is that the whole concept of phenotype is something that geneticists came up with to make it easier to think about the properties of organisms. And when we think about a phenotype, an aspect of an organism, we're thinking about these human constructs that we decided that we were going to think about the length of this finger, the color of these eyes, the texture of the hair. We pick those out as individual things to think about. But that's not how evolution works, and so that's not how genotype and phenotype come about. That's not how organisms come to have the properties they do. Natural selection doesn't favor individuals by selecting for longer third finger or shorter third finger. Instead, natural selection changes allele frequencies based only on their total effect on reproduction. So if a change in DNA sequence increases reproduction, it's going to be favored by natural selection. And that process is independent of whether the increased reproduction is due to changes in bone structure or eye color or hair texture or height or any other property. So natural selection doesn't mind that genes naturally cause effects on many different aspects of an organism, all it sees is the overall effect on reproduction. Let's first think about enzymes, about enzymes in biochemical pathways. So here's an illustration of the pathways, the basic core metabolic pathways by which some sugars are metabolized. Here's the sugar glucose, Here's the series of biochemical reactions, the main set of pathways whereby the glucose sugar in the food we eat turns into energy and or part of how it turns into energy. And here are some different sugars that also feed into that pathway. Galactose, fructose, mannose. Now this is a very complicated pathway and you can see that changing even one step is going to change a whole lot of things. For instance, blocking this step is going to cause all of these intermediates to back up, which is then, so for instance, fructose 1-phosphate is going to accumulate, fructose biphosphate, that's going to affect all of the metabolism of fructose, it's going to affect the metabolism of mannose, um, it may affect the initial movement of glucose into the pathway, all of these things will be changed just by a single mutation. And all of these are connected to other metabolic processes. So here's a problem to help you think about this. Here I've drawn a very simple biochemical pathway. I've shown five enzymes labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I've shown the substrates, intermediates, and products for these enzymes as little shapes. And what I want you to think about is if there was a mutation that affected enzyme 1, so the gene encoding enzyme 1 has a mutation that causes enzyme 1 to not function, how many of the metabolites in this picture are going to be affected? 